Hello and welcome back to Let's Play Tyranny with me, Bergadon. Let's talk to Eb. Salutations, Fatebinder. Or should I now call you Lord of Vendrian's Well? The Spire King? Prince of the Suggestive Vertical Slab. Well, maybe not that last one. Um, Donald will suffice. So if I might ask, what is your plan now? The edict no longer looms overhead, and Kairos's conquest of the Tears seems to be slipping. What with the armies and civil war? Uh, first order of business, I should speak with Tunon. I would counsel you to do just that. I'm sure the events of Vendrian's Well are best explained from your mouth to Tunon's ears. Furthermore, I'd guess the Archon of Justice would want to know your take on the Archons and their divide. And I guess I'm also improvising? Uh, any suggestions? Well, my first suggestion would be to build a boat. Something durable, and take our chances on the high seas far from Kairos. I have a second and more practical suggestion. Look to the horizon and slightly up. By that I mean the other spires. We should see what's atop the others. Otherwise someone else might look first. And what do you know about the spires? Not nearly enough, apparently. To me, they've always been axioms of navigation. You can triangulate a lot of things with a sextant and a clear view to a spire or two. We've long known the spires radiate strong magical fields. And all save the mountain spire connect to the old walls. So it's the sort of thing common folk know from afar, but avoid day to day. All right, I don't want to necessarily destroy the Scarlet Course. Maybe just the voices of Narat. So I'll crush the remaining local p opposition and complete the conquest. I see. I'm sure there's little I can do to persuade you otherwise. Just consider that the people of the Tears will someday bow to Kairos. Why not have them bow to you instead? And that's all I have for now. Well, short of Tunon giving you orders on pain of death, you have the luxury of acting on your own volition. Though the Scarlet Chorus are likely to come for you. Whatever you decide, I'm at your disposal. Well, your assistance will be most helpful. Thanks. And I am thankful to not be a bloody pile of offal in Vendrian's well. Life under your banner will, I'm sure, prove most interesting. I uh, have a moment. Let's speak further. What is it you need? Uh, we should discuss matters at hand. Oh, we're working with the disfavored. You want my advice? My advice would be to get close to Graven Ash and plunge a poisoned shiv in his ear. Graven Ash is my ally. I won't entertain such treachery. I will never understand why deceit is the first instinct of all tearsmen. You are right to take offense. Oh, right. I'm speaking out of line. But I don't really know what to say here. I hate the disfavored, but I'm sworn to your cause, so my honest opinion won't do anyone any good. Now we're working with the disfavored. You want my advice? Oh, right. I'm speaking out of line. But I don't really know what to say here. I hate the disfavored, but I'm sworn to your cause, so my honest opinion won't do anyone any good. Surprised, because Beric did interject there, so why didn't I get loyalty with Beric? Because he could obviously hear the conversation, so... Uh, I have some questions for you. Ask away. Uh, let's speak of magic. You know, I normally charge for this, but for you... Em smiles, awaiting your query. What can you tell me about your magical tradition? Now, you know that's a very personal question. The knowledge I have is a centuries-old gift from the Archon of Tides. I would sooner discard my life than the sanctity of that gift. I will speak in generalities only. Ask. Worst I can tell... Worst I can do is not tell you. Uh, tell me... Tell me about how you influenced Tarada's grave. Trade secret. Not one I'm going to talk about. The School of Tides dies with me, and so too will this. And don't bother trying to change my mind on this matter. It'll just get ugly quick. Tell me how you influence ice, mist, and other forms of water. With years of training. Now look, most of those secrets have already been stolen ages ago by the sages. Doesn't mean I'm going to tell you just because the secret's are already out. But it means you can go ask someone else if you really feel so entitled to know. And before you ask, I've learned plenty from knowledge stolen by the sages. But no, I don't know how to do what Eb does. Uh, magically or otherwise. Can you teach me what you know? I suppose I'm capable of it, but no. The secret to the Archon of Tides dies with me. So Colta Jade, Archon of Tides, is the founder of the School of Tides, as well as its only ruler. 
Though she wore the title Archon, Occulta J never bowed to Kairos, though many have tried to compel her to do so. Having arrived with the settlers that made landfall at Five Wives, she was perhaps the oldest known living tearsman. Capable of manipulating the oceans, the moons, and all the transitory forms of water, Occulta Jade used her magic to form a cabal of seafaring traders, musicians, and ac academicians. That's academicians, yeah. And it was the dedication to the arts that helped the school endure. Uh, for the teaching, for by the teaching these trades to the children of noble families, the school remained in the good graces of the realms. Being able to control most anything cyclical and fluid, a cult of jade has lived for centuries. It could still be alive today, but none know with certainty. In the years before the conquest, the school of tides discovered the overlord's plan to invade. Despite all assumptions that the tears resident. Archon would defend her school and home. To the surprise of everyone, the Archon vanished across the seas, taking nearly the entire school of tides with her into exile across uncharted waters. I assume I need a high enough fear to command her, right? We'll hold off on that for now. Uh, what are the philosoph philosophical teachings of your magic? There's a question I can answer. It would surprise you a little to learn that we see all things... People, wars, seasons, to be cyclical, waxing and waning through their various forms like the tides in the light of Teratus' grave. Teratus the planet has two satellites visible by the naked eye, the tide-locked Teratus' grave and the rapidly orbiting interloper. Scholars have long studied the effects of these two moons on the ocean, uh, currents, and a great deal of folklore concerns the origins of the moons. A common belief in Kairos' empire is that Teratus' grave will finally set on the horizon when Kairos' end our rule ends, whereas those in the tears insist the moons are older than the old walls, while of even Kairos. Just like the sun never sets on the British Empire. The mind is limited. We're born and spend our lives dodging death. We expect all stories to have a beginning and an end. We assume all things start and stop just like us. In truth, all things are cycles, some by matter of minutes, other by matters of years or lifetimes. In the School of Tides, we appreciate patterns of all sorts. Most are called to the depths, others find their interests skybound. Many still find the tides of human emotion and political fortunes far more intriguing than inanimate tides uh, found in the orbits and oceans. Alright, I command you to teach me what you know. You can order me into battle, and I can't... You can order me into a battle I can't win, and I'll follow that order to my death. But I'm taking what I know with me to the end. What's it worth to you? Lantry still beating heart, throwing a charm bracelet made of his beard, and we're talking. Look, I'm off for the advancement of knowledge, but this is absurd. I'd settle for Kairos' severed head? Sure, bring me that. Silver platter optional. And I'll teach you everything I know about magic. Maybe even some of what I know about uh, not tying knots. But if something happens to you, who will preserve your school's teachings? Well, I don't know. The Archon of Not My Problem? That's all I have left that makes me special. Preserving the knowledge for the uh, coxswains about to inherit the tears is not on my agenda. Alright, from what the Archon... From what Archon did the Tidecasters draw upon for their magic? The first Tidecasters were given the gift of magic by our school's founder, a cult of Jade, Archon of Tides. Though she was not of Kairos' ilk, she was as powerful as any Archon. From her name and legacy, we can mimic the moon's pool in the seas and change the currents. And it's from her that we have spells that turn the moon's pleasant hues into a baleful ray of searing grave light. In all these years, I have not grown tired of the thrill of power. It's a rush of carnal humors every time. Grave light is the magical term for the light of the moon, Teratus' grave, specifically when harnessed and manipulated for nefarious purposes. While the moon's rays are normally incapable of causing so much as a mild sunburn, the Tidecasters have long studied magic that can concentrate these rays into bolts and beams of searing doom. The Tidecasters have spent centuries trying to mimic and control the moon's tidal pool in the oceans. We'll often mention that diverting moonlight is the easy stuff, compared to pulling and pushing the tides. But modern times have forced the school of tides to concentrate on the more martial applications of this magic. I'm guessing you can tell me more than I ever wanted to know about the moons. You'd be right. My magic is generally associated with the moon Teratus' grave, but you have to know where Interloper is in the sky when mucking about with mystic forces. Uh, do you control water, or do you mimic the tidal effects the moons have on water? Both, actually. I'm amused you're keen on the difference. 
Our spells of ice and mist affect water directly, but are of limited volume. Displacing your own body weight in water is no mean feat. If I were to move an ocean current, I'd drive myself nuts moving water in front of a boat a little at a time. That's where I'd use a cantrip to simula simulate a tidal pool. Tarada's Grave is the big one, right? Tell me about it. Tarada's Grave is fixed in the sky, always overhead day and night. It was first named by folks living far to the east. They look to the west and see the moon like a permanent hill in the horizon, a grave where the sun dies each evening. That's how the older folks saw it. If you live in the western part of the world, Tarada's Grave is overhead all the time. This means that day and night, it's reflecting the sun's rays. If you know what you're doing, it doesn't just reflect, it magnifies. Interloper is the one that moves in the sky, if I remember their lessons correctly. Exactly. Interloper orbits Tarotus at a steady clip, and its orbit sometimes crosses in front of Tarotus' grave, leading to mystical, mystical calamity if you don't know what you're doing. Have you heard anything from the Tidecasters that left before the war? No. I don't like entertaining the hope. Those cowards are all gone. If they didn't die at sea, they are dead to me. I reserve the right to be pleasantly surprised if they come back, eager to fight the good fight, but I'm not holding my breath. All the brave Tidecasters died, present company accepted. Fine, we can talk about other arcane matters. You know, I normally charge for this, but for you... Do you know anything about the magic of the Archons? Enough to know I'm out of my element. That is to say, I've studied the many Archons a great deal, and have a number of hypotheses and conjectures, but, well, I'm no expert yet. I most have invoked the Archons of times past uh, to work magic. I do wonder what difference of birth experience gives one the magical potential to be an Archon. Most of my studies have been on the question, or into the question of origins of form. It's then we can emulate the magic of Archons that came before us. But is it possible to tap into the magic of Archons yet to be? So far, the answer seems to be no. She looks at the ground with a rumpled smirk. So... Actually, when I was trying to go to sleep last night, I came up with a theory regarding Kairos and um, my character. Because it's supposedly uncommon for someone to be able to cast an Edict twice. And I think maybe what Kairos is is extremely... This is a theory. I mean, I don't hold it in any sort of like validity. But maybe it's Kairos is a really powerful Archon, but since he or she remains this enigmatic figure... No one can emulate Kairos' magic yet. Because you suppose, uh, according to Lantry, you have to be, uh, think of the Archon you're trying to emulate. Well, if you don't know who or what Kairos is, you can't think of Kairos when you're trying to perform their magic. So I think the Edicts might be a specific type of magic to Kairos as an Archon. And I don't know why my character can do it. Maybe like the magic, maybe Kairos' magic is sort of uh, leaking into the world. So people are going to start being able to cast Edicts. I don't know, something I was thinking about. Uh, anyway... Uh, know anything about the old walls and the spires? Not enough. Never enough. Eb smiles, twirling her staff in her hands. As a child, I was terrified of the old walls. I think that's true of most folk. Now that I can arc Gravelight with a wiggle of my fingers, well, I think when I'm a shriveled old hag, dying in the old walls would be a great way to go. And what can you tell me of the Bane? What I know is largely taken from Master Camberell's work as a near-fatal experience venturing close to the old walls. As best as I understand it, the Banes are a bit of magical will that have an extended life of their own. I'm of the belief that they nest or reproduce in the old walls, the only place you regularly find them. Our magic attracts the Bane, that much I know to be true firsthand. Again, this is personal theory, but I'm guessing they eat or drink magic, so our spells are invitations to dine. Ask away. You know, I normally ask away. All right, uh, tell me about yourself. What would you like to know? Tell me about your name. Well, I was born Hazen Lavenja, uh, but for most of my life, I suppose for all the days after, I am known and will be known as Ebb. Tidecaster Ebb for those trying to be obsequious. obsequious. I've also probably used a bunch of aliases that are going to haunt me at some point. Hazen, didn't realize you're a nobility. I know. I dress myself and cook my own food. So misleading. Mother was a magistrate of Ardent. Father was Admiralty. It's mostly meaning. It's mostly meaningless, though. Our lands are now the overlords. Uh, how'd you get the nickname? 
It's not one of those not especially funny jokes that stuck long past its season. I wrote the word Eb incorrectly on a written examination. A master fullback started calling me Eb from then on. He claimed it fit me, said I was a cyclical little sugar that always sees the ebb, never the flow. Uh, let's change the subject. Did you always want to be a Tidecaster? So when I was a little girl, what I really wanted was to be a Marine. The burly girl at the prow of a tier, ter, trireme. I was trying to say tier because she's a tearsman. Uh, first to crack some skulls when the ships rammed. You know, an honest living. Fortunately, the school sought me out before I got myself killed at sea. The school of tides was looking for new blood. My father was an admiral of Haven, so the school wanted me for the political connections. I got to spend my first couple years proving I actually belong with the Tidecasters. That was fun. Uh, what did you do in the years before the war? My husband was born in Apex. He left his prosperous lands to be with me. So the nest was empty. It seemed right we leave my homeland and see, and see his side of the tears. We had a year and a bit to ourselves before the war upturned things. We saw all of Apex. I took him along all my old sailing routes uh, around Five Wives and Sunder. Those were good times. Then came the war end, and I learned I'd be one of the last tearsmen to live free of Kairos. Ever since then, I think Oathbreaker has technically been my chosen profession. Uh, tell me about your family. Trying to salt old wounds? They're all but gone. Or they're all gone, but if you really care to know, I had a husband, three kids, siblings I didn't hate. Every family has its troubles. I was lucky that awkward and stilted dinner banter was the worst of it. Uh, tell me about your husband. Pelax, Aldinos, and I were married in 410. Aldinos was a Falksman of the Vendrian Guard, back before they were starving partisans. But I saw him more as a carpenter. Woodworking was just a hobby of his. My fondest memories are of him trying to shape something. Me making stupid jokes about the firmness of his materials. Uh, what became of him? He perished at the gates of judgment. I saw him die. I don't wish to discuss it. Just know I've made my peace with it. I'm glad I was with him on the field of battle when his time came. I miss him. But that might be, might have been for the best. Though he's only a few years older than me. My studies left me always a bit younger than him. The difference grew with time. Aldinus was slowing down and half-figured at the Gates of Judgment. Wait. Aldinus was slowing down and half-figured at the Gates of Judgment be his last battle. If anything, he got exactly the death he wanted. So in that sense, I'm very happy for him. Uh, tell me about your children. There were the twins, Drevenor and Lorma, then my youngest son, Achimus. Aldinus wanted more, but I was nearing the end of my trials at the School of Tides, and dueling with lethal magics is a terrible idea when with child. Drevenor and Lorma followed my husband's trade and took the Falks. Achimus liked the heart more than people. Can't blame him one bit. I made sure my children could read, and I'm darn proud of that fact. Probably the only thing I did right. And what of the twins? They died at the Gates of Judgment. Or at least, Drevenor died, run through by a disfavored spear. Lorma was at the battle, but I don't know what became of her. My fear has been she was recruited by the Scarlet Chorus. Perhaps she has a new name. If she's still alive. Now what became of the youngest? Without Drevenor and Lorma, uh, without Drevenor and Lorma, Achimus, well he never quite, he took his own life in 430. Eb shrugs, her eyes glancing far away. I should have put him on a trieme and shoved him out into the high seas. He did not ask for birth, nor did I prepare him for the bitterness that life would offer. I'm very sorry for your loss. Spare me the sorrow. We've all lost family to Kairos. I just lost two in one battle. But even then, I'm hardly unique. Oh, what of the rest of your family? My family's haven folk through and through. My mother prided herself on being descended from a hazen rabbin, one of the founding magistrates of the city of Ardent. She looks to the side, mouth twisting in thought. Sad thing is, they died during the conquest. But that's not how I lost contact. I lost contact because magic and travel became my life. I had plenty of time to get to know them as an adult, but I simply missed it. Uh, but that one's my fault. I can't rightly blame Kairos for everything. Not so sure I believe any of this. You don't seem troubled all but you don't seem all that troubled. Well, I'm an accomplished liar, but I've no need to spin a tale about any of this. My husband, most of my kids, my parents. 
Kairos's thugs took them all. If I don't seem broken up, it's because I'm not. I don't feel such things anymore. You sign your magic with a great deal of anger. I like to think of it more as well-refined rage. But I'm using you noticed it all the same. Hate is akin to an acid. A poison of the heart that consumes most from within. And like any fluid, if you know how to hold it, you can apply it. It's a trick of the trade, I suppose. One's surges and dry spells of emotion are no different than the rhythms of the waves. There's a shared logic to taming both. Sadness, mania, rage. I suppose I have these things, but they're just humors in the blood to be pushed, needed, and restrained as the situation demands. All right, let's change the subject. How did he fall in with the Vengerian Guard? What does it matter now that they're gone? They seem the last hope for the tears. And in any sugaring jerk of a chance, still more than no chance at all. Let's change the Ask subject. Away. Let's go back you know, to magic. I normally charge for this, but for you, Ask away. Let's return to our travels. I want to check something real fast with her. What is my loyalty at? Before I go demanding. I think I just went there and demanded it. So I think it's four loyalty, right? Four loyalty and three fear. So let's see if we can't eke out some more loyalty with Ebb real fast to learn that magic. Am I doing? Oh. Ebb nods at your approach and offers a curt bow. What is it you need? Ask away. I have questions about the people of the tears. We all know how to swim and we all know how to fight. Most Northmen are lucky to make half that boast. What would you like to know? I'm curious about the people of the tears. I think you'll find each of us thinks themselves a child of Haven, as in my case, or a child of Azur, child of Apex, or what have you. But I suppose we Tearsmen have our shared customs. The most treasured of those customs used to be the pride of being free of Kairos' rule. Did you have a particular que- or did you have particular questions? Uh, when were the Tears settled? Human settlers arrived over 400 years ago, displaced from a war between what are now Kairos' realms of Trev Trevin and Fertile Sands. A flotilla of barely seaworthy rigs headed west across the high seas. Tearsmen will sometimes speak of the Five Wives. We usually refer both to the first five settlements where the colonists made landfall, as well as to the five matriarchs that went on to form the ruling dynasties of the Tears. Of course, I'm leaving out the matter of the builders of the Old Walls. Who knows when they lived here and why they're gone. But those Old Walls didn't just fall out of the sky. Now why don't men own land or women's ships? For centuries, it's been our way that the men owned the ships, but the women owned the harbors. Our customs don't truly prevent ownership, they limit inheritance. Lands pass to daughters, then sisters, then mothers and aunts. Ships pass to sons, then brothers, then fathers and uncles. It seems strange to outsiders, but it makes sense to me. Men are blessed with wanderlust, women with a sense of the permanent. Likewise, the captain of a ship can't pause to carry a child, and the men grow restless if left in place. In truth, the custom varies from place to place. You'll find men with enough wealth own land, women with enough sway own ships. As is often the case, the nobles pick and choose their traditions. Uh, why didn't the younger realm stand united against Kairos? Are you trying to rub it in? Yes, the younger realms were defeated one at a time by the invaders. Maybe if I was Queen of the Tears, that wouldn't have happened. Well then, what would Queen Ebb have done? I'd have taken the threat seriously the moment troops were stopped, were stopped marching to the gates of judgment. Am I the only person whose mother mentioned that Kairos was a real threat? Opportunity. That's what killed us. Haven wanted to watch the bastard tear fall first. The Apex was hoping Haven would fall. Azur wanted Stalwart to be attacked first. Every realm of the tears, some interest. Every realm of the tears had some interest in watching their neighbors fail first. So we all held back our support until a year or so into the war. Too late by then. Squabbling idiots. Tearsmen live in greater numbers of beast live with greater numbers of beastmen. Uh, what's that like? The beastmen of the tears are hardier and smarter than their kin elsewhere. Unfortunately, we have lived together in relative harmony for some time. Make no mistake, life is difficult for most beastmen in the tears, but compared to say how they are treated in the Northern Empire, I would like to think we tearsmen are a bit more modern and forward thinking, even if just a bit. I suppose I also take an overly optimistic view of our beastly cousins. I find their clumsy honesty endearing, and while no human will say nice things about my cooking, no beastman has ever said anything mean about my worst dishes. 
Uh, what of the major resistors to Kairos' rule? Aside from the ones you slew? Well, the Vendrian Guard were the most staunch opponents of Kairos. With their passing, the Overlord's rule is absolute. Well, aside from the local Archons being in a state of civil war. Was there a particular group you wished to discuss? Uh, tell me about the Unbroken. The Unbroken is the name of the military of the now fallen realm of Stalwart. Every citizen of Stalwart was trained to fight, and all were expected to answer the rallying cry of the Regents, the ruling small council of the realm. A decade ago, Stalwart was the ass end of jokes tearsmen would tell each other. The people of Stalwart are obnoxiously proud of a long history of being invaded, but never losing. The disfavored put an end to their vaunted record of victory. The Unbroken still persist, albeit marginally so. The disfavored withdrew after the Edict of Storms began shredding the landscape. Their holdfast of Sentinel Stand Keep was never taken, and the citizen army, though scattered, could still be rallied. All right, tell me about the Stonestalker tribe. Kairos's war was disastrous to the human realm of Azure, but a stroke of good luck for the numerous beastmen that toiled in Azure's endless wheat fields. With the masters all dead, the serfs have been set free. The Stonestalkers are a tribe born from these newly freed beasts. I imagine they would never bow to Kairos or the Archons. Too many generations have been enslaved. I'd wager anything they'll die before they ever bow. Beastmen understand strength and leadership, but it's always in the concrete sense. I can't pretend to know how they think, but I could never imagine them accepting an absent prima. A distant ruler they can't see or smell seems a bit too abstract. All right, uh, tell me about the Bronze Brotherhood. The Bronze Brotherhood is one of the most feared and famous of the Free City mercenary companies. They serve the highest bidder, and during the war, that was Kairos. Most of the Brotherhood perished in the war, but a handful. The crew hired to work at Lethian's Crossing. They got to babysit the Forge Bound and survived the last few years with minor losses. Well, the band is too small to be a serious threat to the disfavored or the chorus, but they are scourge worshipping berserks that will adopt any enemy for the right price. Maybe even Kairos. Are there other remnants of the younger realms that could still rise against Kairos? Several sages came to our aid during the second battle of Vendrian's Well. I at first thought they meant to kill me, but instead they put their lives on the line for us. They spoke of others in their guild braving the Edict of Fire to salvage lore from the Burning Library. Though I may find them untrustworthy, it must be said that the sages have a certain fearlessness toward the Overlord. Perhaps that could be kindled further. Historically speaking, an alliance with the School of Ink and Quill is just asking to have your efforts stolen and your goals undermined. Mark my words, some things never change. You yeah, think of the sages as a resource, in that sense, we're fools not to use them. Well, perhaps we can shove them in front of the enemy. And the ones that volunteered at Vendrian's Well weren't all bad. I change the subject as she nods, silently awaiting her follow up. Uh, what can you tell me about the different nations of the Tears? Before Kairos came, the Tears were the Younger Realms, the Bastard Tear, and the Free Cities, and about that order of prominence. We're all trace our roots back to the Five Wives, though sometimes a bit of ancestral shoreline seems all we have in common. Uh, tell me about the Younger Realms. Haven, Azura, Apex, and Stalwart have been the four major forces of the Tears for the last four centuries. A few other dynasties have tried their hand, but all eventually were defeated or absorbed into the four we know today. Not sure when the term younger came into fashion, but it's always been a term of humble contrast. Just look at the old walls. Someone was here before us and built them. Don't really know anything about them, but it stands to reason there used to be an older realms that did all the construction. Before Kairos came, I already read that. Uh, tell me about the Bastard Tier. It's the northernmost of the tiers, the choke point to the Northern Empire. It's been a hub of trade for centuries, and a long time the long line of merchant families and private armies have kept the realm largely lawless. Though many used to joke about the bastard city being sacked by rabid dogs, Tunan's capture of the city was a terrible blow to the morale of the tearsmen. We knew that day Kairos was more than just a fun story to scare your kids. Before Kairos came, I already read that. Uh, what can you tell me about the free cities? There's little free about the free cities, save for their independence from the younger realms. They're not physically adjacent, but rather, politically allied by their shared hatred of the other realms. Most all of the free cities were defeated with little effort by Kairos' forces. When I heard it, 
The Rancha said to have agents hire up the mercenaries in order them to simply be elsewhere when the armies of the Overlord arrived. Change the subject, change the subject. Speak of magic. You know, I normally charge for this, but for you, now you know that's. Hey, hey, we have enough loyalty. Look, I understand this import this knowledge is important to you. I assure you, it'll be used for great things. She taps her chin, deep in thought, for several long, silent moments before pounding her staff to the ground with a flourish. I get the feeling I might regret this, but fine, so be it. If someone is going to Im imitate my magic and do glorious things with the Tidecaster legacy, I'd want it to be you. First things first, this is the sigil of Colted Jade, Archon of Tides. Watch carefully. It holds up her right hand, curling her palm as she fans her fingers. With the whip of her wrist, she scribes a pattern in the air, her fingers glowing in orange hue for a moment as she traces in the air. After several hours, you mimic Ebb's gestures, while absorbing her biographical anecdotes about the Archon's life, times, and power. At last, the moment occurs where the understanding clicks. You're no longer aping her movements, uh, but wilf willfully tapping into the power of the Archon. I'd ask that you use this knowledge wisely, but it's not like I do. Now if you'll excuse me, I've talked out for the moment. Perhaps another time. Alright, we'll look at that later. What is it you need? Ask away. All right, what can you tell me of the Archons and the Tears? Not entirely sure. Which is to say, there was a time I studied my enemy in great detail, but I've recently come to learn that much of my information was little more than lies and misdirection. Okay, uh, what are the voices of Nerat? The Archon of Secrets lives up to his name. If he weren't so loathsome a beast, I'd half admire his mastery of the magical arts. Uh, they say he knows all the sigils lost to history, but I've also heard it said that said all that solar knowledge is why he speaks in his different voices. But in truth, I'm learning that most of what I know is just lies and misdirection. Oh, uh, though I guess he'd be a poor Archon of Secrets if I had my facts straight. And what do you know of Graven Ash? Before the conquest, I assumed Graven Ash a harmless old man. An Archon in name only passed his prime. I could not have been more wrong. Many have underestimated the great general by his age. Few of them have made the mistake twice. Ash is a remarkable general. He's led his tiny band of disfavored on a nearly unstoppable rampage of the tears. He does not seem to win his wars with obvious displays of mystic powers, but old-fashioned leadership and good soldiers. A year or so back, under a blue flag talked with a commander, I saw that the Archon knows the name of, over <coughs> of every soldier under his command, living and dead. Where does his favorite speak of Ash? You think he raised each of them from the cradle? I know anything of Cairn. Enough. She inhales sharply, floating her arms to the scout. Why the hostility? The Archon of Stone destroyed much of what I hold dear. Much that I hold dear. I'm glad he's dead. What more need I say? There's clearly a story here. I'd like to hear it. A few years back, the remaining Elder Tidecasters met Karen in battle. Tell us ten men, all but invincible. I thought nothing could stop us if we stood together. Whatever. It's old history. I'm glad you lived through it all. I'm not. I don't need your pity. Let us speak of other things. Uh, what do you know of Siren? I'm sure there may be younger Archons in the historical records, but Siren is certainly an unusually powerful child. It's said half of the Scarlet Chorus is recruited by Siren's persuasive song, and I not doubt it. I also know the voice of Nerat put a shackle on her power, probably feared she'd become the favorite of the, of the rabble. Ask away. Uh, what do you know of Arcane Society? I know a great deal of the Mages of the Tears, or at least their history. Most are dead now. I know a little less about the guilds sworn to Kairos' Archons, but I try to make an effort to know my opposition. Alright, tell me of the Earthshakers. The Earthshakers are the discipline... Disciplines of Cairn? The Disciples of Cairn? I think would be better? Eh, whatever. Archon of Stone. And they share their master's command of tremors and soil. And they also share Cairn's aloof, brooding temperament. From what I gather, the Earthshakers serve the disfavored, but the relationship has been deeply strained by Karen's fall from grace. I could imagine there's the fear of Karen shared the fear Karen shared with them, uh, something subversive or treasonous. Uh, tell me about the Blood Channers. The Blood Channers are the voice of Nerat's cabal, cabal of Mages. Their magic is taken from the Sigil of Siren, 
and from techniques stolen from the School of Wild Wrath. Namely, their magic of fire, as learned from a Thousand Embers, Archon of Fire. They barely qualify as a proper school or guild. Most of them barely literate. And I bet, most of them didn't learn a darn thing, just had their knowledge shoved into their heads by Narat. They have all the brutal buffoonery of the chorus, but with the magic to make their blood less contagious. The only redeeming feature, I guess they make the sages seem not half bad. Uh, what can you tell me of the Forgebound? The Forgebound have an unusual sort of magic. They specialize in slow, painstaking rituals that do not produce a dazzling blast of energy and shards of flying ice like my own magic. Instead, their spells render them immune to the fires of the forge, and at one with their tools of the trade. I admit, I admit a bit, a bit of fascination with the guild. I much prefer the power and brutality of my own magic, but I lived in a calmer, wiser time. I think there could be a great satisfaction in using magic to become the master of one's craft. Uh, tell me about the School of Ink and Quill. Behind the Tidecasters, the sage of the School of Ink and Quill, the second oldest arcane institution in the tiers. We go back a ways. There's a lot of bad blood. If I'm being objective, the sages claim to be scholars interested in collecting, archiving, and preserving lore from and for all humanity. They're quite keen to gather lore, but in no sense do they seek to share their knowledge with the tiersmen. Many of our secrets have been pilfered by sages spies over the centuries, and we're not alone. The sages have the secrets of many other guilds. The generations of theft have made them versatile and dangerous. I'll tell you about your own guild, the School of Tides. Our patron, a cult of jade archon of tides, is as old as the settlers of the Five Wives. For nearly five centuries, we're masters of the coast and the rivers. These days, it's a school of one. You're looking at it. She thumps her chest with a bemused smirk. And why didn't your archon fight in the war? About a year or so before the troops arrived in the bastard tier, the cult of jade proclaimed the age of the tears was over, and said she'd depart southwest into unknown, unending ocean, rather than face Kairos. Most of my guildmates went along, choosing to risk the endless high seas rather than risk battle. A few of us, the militants, our peaceful brethren dubbed us. I chose to stand and fight. Uh, to my knowledge, I'm the last of those who decided to stay and fight. Uh, what was your school like before the war? There's a time when the Tidecasters were the most powerful guild in the tiers. The Kingdom of Haven accepted us as defenders of sea trade. The noble houses gave us peace and quiet in exchange for teaching their sons and daughters music, writing, and navigation. Though the older schools coveted our knowledge, they feared our wrath. Between our destructive magic and our Archon patron, patron, others knew that attacking us meant suicide. And how did the school fall? The Archon Cairn issued a challenge, and Masters Fulvax, Hagravar, and Camberul left to the chance. I told them it was a hopeless clash. I think they were ready to die. As the youngest Tidecaster still in the tears, I... I exercised the better part of valor and went into hiding. Then my sense of shame kicked in and, well, that's about when I fell in with the Vendrian Guard. Old as the Five Wives. By all accounts, a cult of Jade was among the initial settlers that made landfall in the tears before Kairos first cast an edict. Though she's a bit old and stooped, uh, she looked amazing for nearly 500. Let's change the subject. I know a great deal of the mages of the tears, or at least their history. Most are dead now. I know a little less about the guild sworn to Kairos' Archons, but I try to make an effort to know my opposition. I right, what have other magical schools and guilds in the of the tiers? There have been several to crop up and weather across the centuries. The Cutter's Guild took their healing magic north centuries ago. The School of Flowering Winter always limped along as an inconsequential group of ga gardeners. Most other schools in the tiers fizzled out early, slain by suspicious neighbors, or subverted and destroyed by one of the big three schools. Ask away. I'd like to ask uh, you about our travel companions. She nods silently, awaiting your follow-up. Uh, what do you make of Beric? My one concern with Beric is that he's still loyal to Graven Ash and not to you. Beric seems steadfast, faithful, and dependable. But if it comes down to you versus Graven Ash, therein lies the test. If it weren't a tactical asset, uh, it'd be fun to try and pry him out of that suit. Curious to see if his midsection is as strong, firm, and taut as I've imagined it should be. 
And what are your thoughts on Verse? We should consider ourselves fortunate that one of the most deadly members of the Scarlet Furies considers you a suitable gang leader. That said, I think her involvement with you is entirely suspect. I would wager good money the voices of Naratus listening through her, or perhaps seeing what she sees. And what's your take on Lantry? Probably the only word thief I haven't wanted to dismember. Him? I'd merely play with an ice knife. The Wandering Scholar thing seems an act. It's always an act with the sages. Always pretending to know less than they really do. I'm sure he's got a thousand reasons for why he's not like them, or more trustworthy than the rest. But I know his type, so I don't trust him. Aw, that's high praise coming from you. I'm gonna take this staff, or repeatedly jam it into your backside until you prolapse. Jeez. Ah, just like that. Balance is restored to all known existence. You had me worried there. Ask away. What is it you need? Alright, so off camera, I'm going to grab her. I'm going to put her in the party and look through her talents. And I'll also look at the um, new spell core that we unlocked. And I'll go over that next time. And then we'll click on this and see what we can't do. Because we're now done talking with everybody. But I'm curious about hiring some people, too. I think I'm going to focus on the merchants first and not worry about the trainers yet. So... Maybe Kenrick would be good. And Revos? Revos? Because I have stuff to sell, but I don't have anyone to sell it to right now. So. Will do. I know, we'll see. Either way, I'm going to call it here. Thanks for watching. I hope to see you guys in the next episode.